Andrew Hoggard, who is the national president of Federated Farmers. And it is fair to say that uh, farmers are often vilified or identified as the planet wreckers, as those who uh, have got us on the way to hell in a handbar bar basket with electric fences and dairy and everything else. So we're joined now, as I said, by Andrew Hoggard, National President of Federated Farmers. Uh, Andrew, welcome to the programme. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good to be here, Sean, and well done on getting this all set up. Oh, thank you very much indeed. All right. So you look at this package yesterday. You guys dodge a bit of a bullet. You're still not in the emissions trading scheme, are you? Uh, no, that's still to come with the work that's happening with Hewaka Ekanoa. Um, well, that, it'll be a pricing mechanism, supposedly. And yeah, it won't be in the ETS. And I don't think they could ever really put us in the ETS because it barely copes with the few large companies and forestry corporations it's got in the moment. Adding, you know, 40,000 farms to the mix is probably going to break it. So. All right. Yeah, they need And you've, in different. fact, got the farming industry or the farming sector has got a whole lot, hundreds of millions, isn't it, for research? Supposedly. Um, we will wait and see whether whether that's just an announcement or, you know, as we've seen over the last few years, there's been lots of announcements. And um, when it comes time to count the cash, um, very little of it actually gets spent. So we'll wait and see. I mean, the thing I was most pleased with i guess you could call it was the recognition that actually science is the solution here it's not about doing the greenpeace mode of cutting production and going back to subsistence um, caveman type farming so do you was, accept you know, though andrew the common that. wisdom that farmers and the burping of cows and meat production uh, one of the uh, transport aside, the biggest problem we've got with so-called global warming. No, I, I totally reject that one. Actually, um, basically, everyone's got to remember, methane's a very short-lived gas. Um, where our emissions aren't increasing, they're actually decreasing, and so by nature, the composition in the atmosphere isn't changing. So we're not actually adding. You know what we're adding replaces what's dropping out anyway so the fact is and if you look in terms of what's the actual warming impact the actual warming impact of agriculture is very small uh, in new zealand anyway i can't speak for the rest of the world mm. i can only speak for what's happening here in new zealand and in terms of carbon production we are an incredibly low carbon emitting agricultural sector aren't we our farmers are very carbon efficient we're, I think, number one for dairy, uh, number one for sheep meat, and pretty much right up there with beef production as well. So, you know, if we were to just cut our production here in New Zealand, like some people want to do, all that's going to happen is either somewhere overseas, um, people go hungry and get malnourished, or someone else increases production to feed them, and they do it at a worse footprint than us, and... You know, greenhouse gas emissions globally actually go up. Okay, so you're not going to cut production, which I think is a good thing, because you make things that we all consume and need, literally food. Um, yep. What about cutting emissions? Funds here directed towards the agricultural um, sector for research. Um, Charles, uh, Prince Charles, you know, wacky thing about putting masks on cows aside... Can you? Do you think there are much more emissions to be cut? Do you think science can provide some real answers and some real savings carbon emissions-wise? Yeah, look, there's definitely stuff out there at the moment that's um, usable. And overseas, uh, in South America and Europe, they've approved a methane inhibitor for use in cattle, and they're doing more tri larger-scale trials now on farms there. That reduces by up to 30%. Um, it's not in a formulation yet that would work for New Zealand farming systems because it's sort of required to be eaten with every mouthful of food. Um, what we're working on in New Zealand is a slow release version. So, you know, when my cows go to the shed in the morning, they can get a bite of it then and then again in the afternoon. And you know, provide that effect throughout the day rather than needing to be. So this is a dietary supplement. Um, Dietary supplement, yep. Yeah. There's that. There's the, I mean, in terms of what we've already developed, I mean, this country has already developed 
a genetically modified ryegrass, which reduced emissions by 20%. So Ag Research New Zealand's done that. They've had to do all the trial work overseas, um, first in the United States, now I believe in Australia. And, you know, one thing we, we're constantly calling out is, can we please have a discussion on using genetic engineering? Um, it's, uh, it's got not only with the grass, but there's the potential for animal breeding as well to, you know, increase the rate of improvement in the animal genetics. So New Zealand law help. currently against or, or restricting the use of genic, genetically modified organisms, you're saying that is inhibiting our ability to conduct the sort of research that might provide some solutions. Exactly. Um, and also our regulatory settings aren't up to speed for that inhibitor I mentioned before. We've got actually got no category to register that for use in New Zealand and our um, animal compounds and veterinary medicines regulations. So we've been pushing for a couple of years now um, for MPI and the government to, hey, you know, if <laughs> I know you like to do lots of legislation, but here's one we'd actually approve of if you went ahead uh, and did were it. Were any um, of the issues you just mentioned addressed by James Shaw in this package yesterday? Um, I, I mean, it's 300 pages long. We've just sort of read the highlights version. Um, would have to dig in. You know, my guys are still digging in deep into it to see if there's anything in there. Um, but, I mean, I at a brief glance, I would say no, unless some of this fund is actually going to help pay for or, you know, create provide resources to actually move that re legislation through and get those regulations in place. Um you know, I, I we'll have to wait and see what the centre actually does because there's already quite a number of research um, things going on and already various groupings. Um, so really need to understand how it fits in with the mix that we've already got. Um, is it replicating? Is there overlap? Um, are they all working together? Um, so you're that's... telling me there's 340 million that is setting up this centre for climate action on agricultural emissions. You guys, who are the agricultural sector, you, you haven't really been consulted on this. Um, it was mentioned in a meeting. Um, oh, that mentioned in a we, meeting is way an different. Andrew, mentioned yeah. in a meeting is way different than what are you guys doing in this space now? How do we focus that more and put some more money into it? The, you know, we mentioned it in passing in a meeting, the expenditure of $340 million. That seems well, a long way from consultation. Got, yeah, we, we just got the title in a meeting. It was a suggested wouldn't this be a good idea? And we were like, yeah. I mean, to be fair, they may have consulted with the people, like Federated Farmers, we don't do the research, yep. uh, that's the levy bodies. So they may have consulted with them, I don't know. And that's something that needs to be, you know, have they done a map of what's all the research that's currently happening here and around the world? Where are the gaps? What funding's needed to accelerate that? Um, you know, I don't know if they've done all that work and that's probably something that needs to be teased out to make sure that, hey, this is a smart plan. All right, is there anything in yesterday's package that will impact negatively or positively in the short to medium term on your average New Zealand farmer? Not that we've seen so far. Um, basically, well, in terms of we're all taxpayers, so if all <laughs> this money's been thrown at things that aren't efficient, then that's not only my taxes paying for it, but in likelihood my daughter's in years to come having to repay that bill. So... In terms of the only negatives I can see would be, are all these things properly well thought out? Are they, you know, sensible plans? Have they been worked on? Or was it all stuff that was dreamed up at the last minute? That I don't know the answer to that. And mm. that would be my overriding concern. All right. We know that an awful lot of arable farmland in New Zealand, because of the economic incentives created, is being turned into carbon sinks uh, by planting trees on it many in the agricultural sector not so keen on that i know 50 shades of green have launched a an ongoing campaign against that but at the end of the day it's farmers who are taking the money and selling the land for the carbon sinks is there anything in this package that might stop that trend and is it a trend that federated farmers are happy with um so with regards to the 
planting of the pines, there um, there's been a separate piece of um, work that's been happening on that. Uh, we just recently submitted on that and we proposed a number of changes in terms of trying to, you know, even out the marketplace in effect and, you know, overriding, we want farmers to be able to choose the land use that's most suitable for them but it's got to be based on sound market principles, not a distorted marketplace. And we do think with things like how the overseas investment sort of offices or the rules are set up, it creates an incentive for people to buy land for carbon forestry rather than carrying on farming. So there's a whole range of sort of arguments we're proposing in our um, submission uh, to that around how, the, how everything could be changed better to provide a better, uh, more level playing field. Um, so we are concerned about what is happening, particularly when you sort of see, here's some of the prices of farming that's valued at $8,000 a hectare and an overseas investor's paying $22,000 a hectare when they'll never make, you know, based on current carbon prices, they're never going to make that money back on it. So it just seems there's some weird behaviour happening at the moment, which is really distorting um, the price of farmland. All right. Andrew, do you think this package yesterday is going to save the planet? Um, I'm personally of the view that um, it's probably, you know, I'm not one of these doomsday, doomsday people that think everything's going to go to hell in a handbasket. Yep, we'll probably get a little bit warmer. Um, but I don't really get into the whole the end is nigh stuff. I, you know, I do take for the fact, you know, I'm milking during winter now, so obviously things are getting a bit warmer, but it's, I don't, really get the whole end of the world thing um i don't you know new zealand on its own isn't going to change anything um the rest of the world's got to be doing what we're doing and at the moment they're not, they're not that's right and andrew you say right now today this isn't going to impact negatively or positively necessarily anyone in the farming sector anyone down at the farm gate well I'll caveat that by saying we haven't fully read all 300 pages yet, so there might be something in the details that um, we have missed yet, but we'll, we'll keep reading and, um, yeah, hopefully not. But at high level, it doesn't appear to be too disastrous or anything. You're just really. checking, have you already milked this morning? Uh, yep, yep. Um, I had the guys, uh, I've been milking, I've had guys off, so it was my first sleep in for a week. Um, so I just went and shifted some calves and stuff before I got on with you. I love a man who starts work early. Andrew, thank you very much indeed for your time. That's Andrew Hoggart. He's the National President of Federated Farmers.